the first half of it is my story and my family's story of mm -hmm. addiction. And then the second half of it is what I do and others do daily to maintain our uh, sobriety. I'm curious to know what made you take the, the, the right-hand path, I guess. I met the Bad Brains at that point, and then I started getting into yoga and, and, and then the music. You know, I started playing music in 81, and to me that was always like a lifeline out of whatever I was going through at the time. <laughs> So being able to take shelter of the music and the spirituality, I became a monk for two years, a uh, Hare Krishna monk. So even though I went off the rails and I, I kept dabbling and doing whatever, and then just full-blown, like 87, the guy had stolen a lot of cocaine from the Cuban cartel down there, and they came and shot up the house with AR-15s. So that was my first experience uh with uh using free base cocaine i mean my friend read the book he, he he was like how the hell are you even still alive this is an experience of the void hey everyone welcome to occupy the void i'm your host christina rowett with me today is a man who's celebrating an important milestone john joseph Author, Iron Man, musician, all those things. Um, the new book's called Destroying Monsters. It's about addiction. Um, how does it feel to um, do this? Get this out? Very well. Very well. I mean, uh, I worked on the book, I don't know, about three years, three and a half years, and uh, lost my brother in the process uh, from addiction. So it really, you know, hit home with the message of, um what's in the book and uh i think it's going to help a lot of people struggling i mean it's the addiction in america is just exploded i mean it was already bad and then covid hit and the lockdowns the isolation the depression a lot of people i know relapsed uh a lot of people i know that never had drug and alcohol issues started to have drug and alcohol issues uh so yeah i hope you know, like with any other book that I wrote, that it uh, the message resonates with people and can help. Uh, even if it helps save one life, it's like, what's the value? What you know? What you can't put a price tag on that. And uh, totally. Well, you being know, a service so is a part a part of sobriety, right? It's it's just another way of being a service, like using your skills to tell stories. That's what yeah. I mean. That's well. What well that's that's you know that's what i've done since i wrote my first book the evolution of a crow magnon and uh well i try to tell it in a very personal way even this book i had to really go back and reflect on a lot of stuff that we went through as kids really? and uh you know i started using drugs and alcohol at 12 years old to like numb myself from some of that stuff which was like drinking and, um, you know, taking drugs out of people's parents' medicine cabinets. And yeah, it was a heavy book to write. And uh, I mean, the day I got the call, I was down here that my brother died and I couldn't get a flight. I couldn't do nothing. So, um, well, yeah. I yeah. on my computer and I wrote an entire chapter like for the next like 18 hours i was just in tears writing about his life and what we went through as kids and how i felt i let him down in a lot of ways too there's a lot of um survivor's guilt brutal honesty in there too i mean he always looked up to me you know as the guy i'm doing the music and all the rest of the stuff and then you know when i when I relapsed in the 80s and I was doing all the crack and everything like that, I, I just feel um, that uh, I let him down in a lot of ways. And uh, he was getting over the death of his then wife who died from cancer. And instead of being strong, I had my issues too. And then we were both using, you know, together and, uh, well, 
Trauma is a big and deal. He, and, and, he yeah. never, and he never stopped. What you said on um, the last time we spoke was there's some figures that you talk about in the book that 80% of addicts have had endured some kind of trauma. And I've read your book, Evolution of a Cro-Magnon, and what you guys went through as children in foster care and the abuse and stuff, like, it's not surprising that it leaves a mark that makes it very hard to, like, those are memories that are imprinted, especially as a child. Yeah. And, that's very hard to move on. And then if you compound it with his loss um, of his wife, like that's that's a that's a powerful, dangerous combination. What do you think um, made you take a different and you know what you what you said as well about your father, like it's a generational thing that his addiction played a big role in what you guys yeah. went through. And him kind of turning away from, you know, his his career as a fighter to, you know, choose the life of a gangster and drug addiction and, um, and alcohol and all that kind of stuff. That's a lot, that's a lot to process. And I think I'm curious to know what made you take the, the, the right hand path, I guess, when you guys kind of, I, obviously you went, you guys both went down, if you say the left hand path together for a long time, but what do you think made you kind of veer off that street? I mean, I credit um, meeting the right people at the right time. I mean, I did, uh, I did time in lockup and, you know, got out, was still an addict. So, and then I, I went into the Navy and I fucked that up because I was still a drug addict and I started a drug business, um, smuggling and selling drugs. Like into in the Navy? The yeah, yeah. And, uh, I, I mean, I was doing it to pay for my habit and make money and do whatever, but, um... Like I met the bad brains at that point, and then I started getting into yoga and 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 then the music. You know, I started playing music in '81, and to me, that was always like a lifeline out of whatever I was going through at the time. So being able to take shelter of the music and the spirituality, I became a monk for two years, a uh, Hare Krishna monk, and um, you know. And the lessons of like HR, especially from Bad Brains and JW, who was letting me live at his music studio. So even though I went off the rails and I, I kept dabbling and doing whatever, and then just full blown fucking just, yeah, um, that's the it's crack pill. The free. I mean, my friend read the book. He, he he was like, "How the hell are you even still alive?" He just read this book because I really tried to put it at, at like, okay, I went through all this shit, but why? Why did I go through it? And yeah. it, like, it started with my father's addiction. Like my father, you know, using drugs and alcohol and all that, and and um, and destroyed the family, hmm. and uh, was very violent toward my mother. Um, so the state, you know, took us away and, um, put us into a home that was even more violent than what we were experiencing, uh, living with my mother. And, yeah. um, you know, that was, that was, uh, that was crazy. And that lasted, you know, like six years, mm -hmm. uh, just shy of six years every day, just Man, insane okay. stuff happening. And, um. You know, I was I always had that outlet of music and I was, you know, athletic too. So I got into like, you know, bike racing and, and running. And then, you know, obviously um, later on uh, Ironman. But, uh, you know, the thing the thing is, is that even after I was able to survive what I don't think too many would have um because I was on the streets of New York, 88 to 90, robbing drug, like the most violent drug gangs. And um, I mean, yeah. the first yeah. time I freebased was in Miami in like 87 and, or, or yeah, like 87. And um, the guy had stolen a lot of cocaine from the Cuban cartel down there and they came and shot up the house with AR 15s. So that was my first experience, uh, with, uh, using free base cocaine. Somebody <laughs> tried to, murder, somebody tried to murder me. And then it just escalated from there. 
And you usually, me. the universe shows you a sign that, like, you should, this is a very dark place you don't want to go down, but it was too late at that point. Yeah. Um, it just, like, the freebasing is so addictive, and mm. it was, for me, it was the rush, too, because, mm. you know, I came up on the streets, so it was always, like, the challenge of, yeah, you know, getting the drugs and I the was kind of the ritual, the, yeah, it's a very ritualistic behavior. Yeah, but for me, it was the violent, the violence was the ritual because yeah. if I didn't have money, then I'm going to go take your shit. And I mean, one Colombian drug dude came in our car and I fucking bashed him up and threw him out of the car at like 50 miles an hour while he's trying to shoot me with his pistol. Jesus. So, I mean, it was just like that. And, and, you know, I was AWOL from the military and just out of control, out of yeah. control. And, um, you'll have you some know, movie, man. You'll have some movie. Yeah. And, and you know what the thing is, is like, even when I beat that, it got to be 99. And then like, you know, I was with the wrong people and going to clubs in New York and the club scene was happening yep. and I'm fucking taking ecstasy and smoking weed and drinking champ. Like it was just, I, I had carte blanche at all the clubs and the hottest parties in New York. We've all been there. And then I had a weed service. I was delivering to Dave Chappelle and fucking, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, Hard not to see board and all these people and you know i was like i just something happened some which i think the universe again stepped in and kind of intervened on my behalf and mm -hmm. i got busted by the cops and on a freak like thing it shouldn't even happen because i never I would only go to people's houses that I knew, and like, yeah. so I decided to meet somebody on the street, which I never do. And he got in the car. He, it was just crazy. Like the cops followed him from something else. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, "All right, that's it." So it was like twenty-three years ago. Mm -hmm. Now I just said, and I guess that was like two thousand one, right before nine eleven. Mm -hmm. I just said that's it. I'm not. I'm not touching this shit anymore. I I I I've been clean off everything, and the day before nine eleven, like two days before nine eleven in New York City, I got a call that my brother was dying. You better come get him. Man. So I had to go to Staten Island and do an intervention. He was living in this woman's attic, and I didn't even recognize him. He was so dirty and lost so much weight, and like I said. If you you know if you don't come with me, I'm gonna I'm gonna fucking knock you out and and drag you. So I took him uh, um, September 10th, 2001. We're coming across from Staten Island, the East River. You know, there's the Twin Towers, and he's crying, and he's like, "Thank you." And I had him go into a rehab the next day in St. Thomas with a friend of ours, and um, got up. To put the weather on, boom, first plane hits, uh, second plane hits, terrorist attack, whatever. You, you know, I have my theories on the whole shit, but that don't matter. All the thing, yes. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the fact is I couldn't get him on a flight for about three weeks. So mm -hmm. he detoxed in my house for three weeks on my couch, reliving every single fucking painful thing he ever went through in his life while he's trying to get the drugs out of his system and that was just and that's when i had this breakthrough moment with my mother and and just mm -hmm. called her up and had to give her the sauce because of what i was experiencing with my brother and that's when she told me that um she never planned to have me or him she only planned to have my older brother and then my father had raped her broke into her house and raped her and that's how I was conceived and then you know my young my younger brother but um you know the crazy thing is that my brother uh was a disabled veteran that the military fucked him up in a surgery and he got the untreatable Mercer so they had to do an operation on him so he had to go to, they had to put him in a medically induced coma because with his heart the way it was and all the drugs in his system 
they had to detox him off the drugs before they could do the heart surgery. Mm -hmm. So they sent him up to a detox hospital upstate New York. Mm -hmm. and, and the nurse came in. I don't know if I told you this last time. The nurse came in and she picks up his chart and she was like, oh, Frank McGowan, are you any relation to John McGowan? And he's like, yeah, John Joseph McGowan from the chrome eggs. That's my brother. And uh, she's like, no, John Emil McGowan. Like you and Frank, Frank was like, that's my father. Whoa. Like, why? Are you? She's like, John Emil McGowan is your father. And Frank was like, yeah. Why are you asking? She said, I'll be right back. She comes back like a few minutes later. Her face, her jaw just dropped. And she said, your father is, in, is dying in the room next to you. Yep. I mean, I still, I still get Dude, goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps. That is hectic. That is a... That you, is... Can't even, you can't even make that up. If I put that shit in a movie, nobody Ooh. would believe it. He I never even knew he was in the military. Yeah. But... So then she said, well, he wants to send in a priest to beg, to ask for forgiveness, for your forgiveness. And my brother said, tell him to go to hell for what he did to my mother and us. And, um, you know, the crazy thing was when he left, he got, the, he, you know, my father uh, passed away there. Mm -hmm. And Frank got the, uh, the detox and then they had the surgery. So when he was getting discharged... They gave him a paper bag with all... My father was homeless. He had no money. So he only had a filthy pair of pants and a shirt, a filthy pair of sneakers, and a, and a, and a half a, a, a pack of um, camel non-filters. That's what his whole life was reduced to for all the shit. I always say karma never loses an address. And oh, man. Yeah. I told Frank, I said... That was the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, holding up a mirror to you, showing you. You had three kids that you walked away from. He walked away from his kids. He was violent. You're violent. He's a drug addict, alcoholic. So are you. I said, this is your destiny, man. Yeah. And then he gets out. And then his wife oh, and then his girlfriend, who was on kidney dialysis, they were taking oxys and she died in his arms. And then through the pandemic, he was isolated and alone, and then the VA was like, we're not going to uh, give you, we're not going to treat you unless you get the vaccine and the booster, and he did that, and he had a stroke, and he never recovered from that, and he couldn't, he couldn't even leave the house. So then the VA was just delivering Oxycontins to him, and he was not even eating, yeah, and he used the Uber service to bring him alcohol, bottle a bottle every day, a fifth of fucking whiskey. He finished off every day, and then uh, his heart just stopped, and that was it. I got the call, and how? You know, like, yeah, how have yeah. you not relapsed through this? It is actually an incredible achievement to go through all of that. Like, holy yeah, well, crap, dude! Like, this is your family, like your mother's revelation, your father, your brother, like everyone your closest relatives all unraveling its like secrets and, you know, outcomes like it's dude, like this is transformative stuff to, to achieve sobriety yeah. in the face of this is a big deal. Well, and you know, those, you are the tests, so those are the tests that come. And yeah. I said that in this book, the first half of it is my story and my family's story of mm -hmm. addiction. And then the second half of it is what I do and others do daily to maintain our uh sobriety cool. so it's uh you know it's but, like, like yeah. even when he died i never said like i'm gonna go get fucked up to deal with this that's not how i deal with yeah i don't deal with pressure thinking like drugs and alcohol is the answer i know that it's not the answer no for me it's it's about my sadhana my spiritual practice Helping other people, training, hmm. eating right, meditation, all of that. So that's how um, I deal with it. That's how I deal with uh, hmm. pressure. Yep. You know, when, when it comes, that's why I never bugged out. Even during the pandemic, I was in Ground Zero in New York City, and it was a complete fucking ghost town. Like, 
I posted videos back then, like... And what they did to businesses as well, like what people's livelihoods, like the mental health impact of... They, taking wiped, out er they wiped out everything. Like I, know, I know. What they did... We had 300 days of lockdown in Melbourne, and there are people who will never recover from that kind of trauma. That but That is not... Okay. But just, anyway, we won't go down that path, because that's a whole story. Um, but... Uh, well, I, just, yeah. I just read... It. Well, it, it, it's relevant, because yeah. oh, what they did to people... It caused a lot of depression. It caused, and that's why I had to talk about it because I saw, just like I talked about the Hare Krishna movement and my experience and how it was like a, what they did and changed the movement into was a cult. And yep. so many people went to that movement at the, you know, at the end, you know, at the end of their rope, looking for some something, something, any bit of hope, and then, and then people yep. just exploited them. And I just posted up the whole thing that the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the planet took place. So the middle class working people, we all got poor. We lost everything. But the wealth of the world's 2,668 billionaires has risen by 3.78 trillion during 2020. Oh, so they they fucking made money. They closed down the mom and pop stores, right? But then you you know Jeff Bezos made all this money because you had the offer from order from Amazon, and bringing everyone down to this like the like the epidemic of homelessness, of addiction, of all the stuff that's going on in America, has a lot yeah. to do with that shift of wealth. Like I was prepared for it. Like even when the fucking when the whole shit was locked down, I was training for an Ironman. Yeah, I trained. I trained for Iron. I was training. I had an Ironman on the table, so I was going out riding my bike. I would ride out to the to the beach and swim. Or mm -hmm. there was no gym, so I just worked out wherever I could. I I ran. I did. I sent videos of me on the Brooklyn Bridge and I ran up to Times Square and I'm the only person in Times Square. Imagine that. I'm sitting in Times Square, the fucking windows of the world, and I'm the only person there. That's that's that's, that's d distressing. Like, it kind of, it's inspiring. What, I like this movement of like people like you and Rich Roll and David Goggins and all these people who are like the physicality of it will change your mental state. When you become, it absolutely does, you know, it like it will impact your mental state, your mental the, health. Will you know, the body, you know, the body achieves what the mind conceives, you know, and uh, yeah, that's what that's that's, that's why you know I doubled down on my meditation and everything else that I was doing, and in any in any bad situation, mm. that's what I do. I I I, I unequivocally know, like, hey. Getting high the answer to any problems that we may face. The addict mind is a dangerous one. I talk to my therapist all the time about it. The addict mind, there's the high art mind, there's the addict mind, and it's they're just different minds. And honestly, life is too goddamn short to not be dialed in, you know, like it's important. Yeah. So I guess um, Evolution of a Cro-Magnon was your memoir, and um, the PMA effect is an instructional guide, right? So it sounds like destroying monsters is both, which is cool. Which yeah, is I mean, it really is. It's like a combination of the two, but there's a lot of stuff that wasn't in the evolution that's in this book um, because I really focus, like I said, on how our journey as a family, mm. how my journey in life, uh was controlled by my addictions i know you've talked a lot on social media about like the essence of punk rock being thinking for yourself and questioning authority and that there's a lot of people who aren't living by that value and if you're not living by the value you're not really aligned with the culture i think in in my opinion well um, you know growing up in new york i was it, i was privy to all the early hip-hop stuff too you would go like, up I, in the, the time man like 70s early 80s. oh man i was like i was in spotted in 78 and that's the yeah. first time i ever heard the word homeboy and then african barbada and then you know oh. i just wrote that i i actually fed krs1 when he lived in the shelter because i was a Hare krishna we used to go there and feed everybody and Wild i got to see like big daddy kane and eric b and rakeem when paid in full came out and you know smooth hustler and just like all the early 
Yeah. Public TV, like, and even all that. Grandmaster, I saw Grandmaster Flash open up for the Clash. Mm. Like, what? Oh, God, I wish to time travel, man. That's that's some. Which band was yeah. the band that got banned from Saturday Night Live for causing a riot? I can't remember. Here, I was there that you, night. You were I'm the there. one. So you Ian, I, I, yeah, I was the one. So Ian knew me from DC. So I found out the whole story because last year I talked to Ian on his birthday, and yeah. he was like, "Yeah." Ian Mackay from Fugazi, my oh, thread. The Godfather of Straight Edge. I hope you give him a shout yeah, out. So the, the thing was, he was in his house and the phone rings, and he's like, he answers it. He's like, hello. And he's like, hi, Ian. This is Lauren Michaels from Saturday Night Live. And he's like, yo, get the fuck out of here. Stop, stop messing me. He's what? like, yeah. it's Ian, it's, it's Lauren Michaels from Saturday Night Live. Somebody wants to talk to you. He hands the phone over to John Belushi, and John Belushi goes, Hey, Ian, I heard you got a kick-ass punk scene down in D.C. What? Because he was friends with Lee Ving in Fear Play. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Then, um, <laughs> so then he goes, Yo, get as many people as you can. We're, you know, Fear yeah, yeah, yeah. on oh, Halloween boy. night, and we want to show the world what punk rock is all about right this was halloween 81 so yeah, that's ian, so iconic bro ian comes up to new york with a bunch of people but then he comes downtown and he finds he's looking for punks downtown he sees me on saint mark's he's like yo get everybody you can and tell them come up to rockefeller center the password to get in is ian mckay so I go find all these punks, and I invited all of them, and I'm like, yo. So if a hey, fight broke out between yeah. D.C. and New York, and... I've watched that thing a million times. It's like the best variety show moment in punk rock history. I was like, that well, is... The Rolling Stone sick. voted it the most uh, iconic rock and roll moment ever in Saturday Night Live. hundred percent. I back that 20,000% like that. I was like, I'll look at the culture on mainstream television, like back in the day when everyone watched TV, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm, mean, it was I'm sorry. This is bro- it, was, it was a fight broke out. That's yeah. I'm that's it turned we're into covering like- all the good shit. We're covering the book. We, we had to add a little bit of the culture. It's important. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'm pumped. Yeah. Yeah, man, you know, it's just, I was around, I was around in the in the 70s, I was going to Max's in, at the Summer of Punk 1977 and CB's, yeah. you know, going to after hour clubs like Stick Balls, which was a punk club, punk uh, after hours. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. just like seeing that whole, seeing the Ramones hanging out mm-hmm. at Rockaway Beach because I was living on the streets of Rockaway, so yeah, yeah. I had this my old summer i was like 15 i'm i'm going i'm hanging out in rockaway then going to sell drugs in forest park or at madison square garden then hanging out you know yeah. down on the over east side or fucking going to max's and or mm. cbs or doing whatever and it was just like no you know i didn't have to answer to nobody it was just this wild time yeah to be up you had the son of Sam in New York and the blackout and just all the craziness. And I'm this fucking wild fucking teenager, just like, yeah, you know, just, just you did, fucking you did it right at the right time, like getting right, getting your head right. And I think it's an, a massive achievement, like getting the sense of how the drug culture was so pervasive in that scene to get clear. Yeah. To be able to like you know like in your book you're talking about that like- was the whole shit was the heroin i mean you know the dead boys used to get paid in fucking a a, a, a fucking bundle of heroin and a bag of mcdonald's from hilly crystal who owned cbg <laughs> and managed them and yeah. you know it was very, like my first punk rock girlfriend or first girlfriend i ever had like she was two years older than me she died of an overdose of heroin and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. i just so many people die of dope and and drugs and and the and you know the punk rock shit was always like I was down in Norfolk in mm-hmm. 1980 and then those bands in the spring of 1980 started coming down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw um, 
the Teen Idols and the Untouchables, which was Ian, and that whole posse came down, and yeah. and then like Henry was there, and all these people, and they're like, nah, we don't. And I'm all yeah. fucked up on drugs and drinking, and they're like, no. I was like, these guys were wild, like slam dancing and stage diving, and then like they're like, nah, we don't, we don't do any drugs or drink or any of that, and I'm like, what? Like I I, I couldn't figure it out, but I hung out, I gravitated toward the two, yeah, maniacs <laughs> in that scene. This guy Jay and Billy, and we were taking drugs together and fighting, and yeah, you know, doing doing whatever. But it, it was, yeah, and I quit from the military and then went back to New York. Hmm. But I started seeing like, hey man, I got in this fight against this Puerto Rican gang, and I was high on quaaludes and fucking, and I got stabbed. But I beat a bunch, of, I beat like a bunch of them down with a chain. They couldn't believe it. The Beastie Boys were there. They were like, you know, nobody would fight this Puerto Rican gang. We're pulling knives and trying to stab people, beating people up at the Bad Brain show. And I just, I just fought them. I was like, fuck that. I'm not scared of these people. And, uh, you know, then, like, they put yeah. a KOS on me, which means kill on, on sight. sight. Yeah, yeah, I remember it from your book. So then, like, you know, I had this, the bad brains actually squashed that for me, and then they let me move in the studio, and that was, the, that was you know, yeah. I guess. What a win to be taken under. Like, HR is so iconic. Like, if, if you don't know people out there, like, he was one of the most iconic front men in the history of punk rock. Ever. Not yeah, even I'm, one of the most. Not even in punk rock, just in music. Listen, I saw Led Zeppelin. I saw The Who. I saw every punk band you could fucking think of. Nobody ever in the history of music in that hard shit was ever could touch HR when HR was HR in 81 and 82. And because he brought this spiritual man, he was like the punk rock Bob Marley. Like, he had fucking people just follow him. Mm. And, like, luck, thankfully, he was telling everybody to do the right thing. Get off the drugs and the alcohol and mm. and um, eat good and be yeah. spiritual. You know? We had, like, heart and soul, right? And that comes across. Like, you can't hide who you are in your music. You can't hide who you are in your music. It will always come out. And that's just facts. When we better ourselves, we better humanity. We're all connected, so every bright light that turns on lights up the whole world. You have to lead by example. That's a real... That's yeah, yeah, yeah. A, and that goes back to thing. your lifestyle, like, and in, and like this book. Like, if you can go through everything you went through and be this person and be this positive force and be someone engaged with your physical and mental health, which are not separate, then anyone can. And yeah. I, I guess, what do you want people to walk away from reading the book feeling? What do you want them to like? Oh, it's never hopeless because, like, no matter how low that we, you know, people talk about, oh, I was, I was rock bottom. You can actually be, you can go, you can be under the rocks. You could be fucking lower than, I was below rock bottom. Yeah. When I, when I first got off those drugs, like, somebody tried to murder me in a fucking crack house and took everything I lost, you know, it's just, no matter how hopeless it seems, mm. there's always a way to climb out from wherever, yeah. wherever we, that's the message of the book. I didn't want to just tell my story of this is what I went through. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, sh I wanted it to also be like you said, the PMA effect in the sense that these are the tools you can use from myself as well as other people who are in. I had a quote. There's, there's a quote from uh, Steve-O. There's a quote from all these people who are in long-term recovery. And this is what they do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Stay clean and sober. So that's the whole thing about the book is. Um, yeah. I hope, you know, they're like. In America, they've just given up. They've raised the the white flag on on a you know we're having like well over a hundred thousand fentanyl deaths uh, every single year now. It breaks yeah. my heart to see this shit. Yeah. It's crazy. So I mean, that's that's a hard. My, my hope is that people walk away and they read the book, but like any other book. If you don't apply what's in the book, it's useless. It's you know we don't want armchair philosophers. 
When I read books back in the day in the 80s or 81, when I started reading like, you know, the I Ching and the Bhagavad Gita and all these books, I applied the knowledge to my life. That's what I tell people. Mm. Whatever's in this book, right? If you don't apply what's in these pages to your life, it's useless. You know, it goes in one ear and out the other, you know, and that's, that That's was the difference with me is that if I read something, if I read a book on screenwriting, if I read a book on whatever it is, Mm. I'm going to try to take the active steps every Mm. day to apply that knowledge, you know? And action is healing. Like taking action is healing. Like all that, you know, you know, a lot of um, addiction stems from poor self-worth and inability to manage your emotions, you know, you build self-worth by, I think Goggin said it, by uh, irrefutable evidence that you're the kind of person that you want to be. Like, you've got irrefutable... You the mind, you know, yeah. you have to so. you have to do things that you don't want to do, and every mm-hmm. time you show up when you... I was just watching uh, Andrew Huberman, who I just sent, Dr. Huberman, who I just sent the book to today, and he said that a certain part of the brain is affected Every day when we take on a difficult task that we're resisting to do and we do it. And it was it was the, the one of the best podcasts I've seen is uh, Andrew Huberman had uh, David Goggins on. And the conversation okay. those two, because David Goggins is just raw. He's just like, I know this is what I got to do. But then, you know, uh, Dr. Huberman was able to break it down into scientific terms. Yeah, this is what you were this is what was affecting a particular part of your brain and the, you know, the end, the serotonin or whatever, you know, he was just breaking it down scientifically. And I was like, wow, but that's what it's all about. You know, we have to, Stephen Pressfield talks about that too, defeating resistance in his book, the war of art. I love that. Like, book. Uh, resistance is always lying and full of shit. So. <laughs> and and gonna, guys, yeah, resistance is the just for people who haven't read the book. Resistance is the force that hits you when you're meant when you're doing anything meaningful. It is that force against it that says you're not good enough. You can't do this. Don't start. Do you know like all that sort of stuff? And that book, man. If you want to read a book, read this book first, but read that book second because that shit changed my life. War of Art. Isn't it? I quote the War yeah. of Art many times in that book. Yeah, and dog. That's what's Steve, up. Anyway, Pressfield's uh, next That's level. Yeah. I'm glad for all these thinkers out there and thanks for sharing um your story and being in it. Yeah. More than I that, know. being an example. Well, you know what? My teacher said example is better than precept. So, you know, Prabhupada Acharya means one who leads by example, and that's what he was. And like he was, you know, he had no possessions. He sl- he was humble, he slept on the floor, he served everybody. Like he would cook, serve, clean. And made sure everybody was full before he took a grain of rice. That's that's what it's all about. And right. that's why, you know, I learned from Prabhupada and, um, you know, to be like everybody talks shit on the Internet now. That's what that's what social media is all about. Like my mother says. Hit them with a prayer instead of a chair. And your focus is where it should be. And this is this is a great moment for you to share your story and some practical advice to bring it into practice. So that is the book. Um, please send me an image of that so I can put it on YouTube. And this, Walking yeah, through hell, book, battling addiction and finding recovery. Yeah. The book is out now. So no, uh, it's it. out. Oh, yeah, it will be out by the it's time. Okay, it's out now. It's, it's out, out literally the same time. It's out on Wednesday. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for listening. Hope you got something from it. Suss the book and um, do some reading and take some action. This is an experience of the void.